<laughs> so you're wondering why the uh, Spanish introduction. So we have some very, very special guests today. And I didn't even get a chance to talk to him beforehand. But uh, brother, we'll get you up here at the end. Uh, T.J. Lindsay from Heart of Christ Ministries and his family, his, uh, his wife, uh, Pamela, and his daughter, Maya, are here visiting. And they are distinguished guests and with great, great friends of ours and uh, love them to death. And they, that is our, our singular overseas mission that we support. And I love it. And I can't wait to hear and get an update about it uh, at the end today. And so that's why Marcus blessed us with a little bit. I tried to do a little Spanish class the other night. It didn't work too well. So if you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 38. And it's kind of interesting if you look at the sermon topic today. So you'd have thought that uh, when we're having a missionary here, an overseas mission, that we would have a missions type of message. Uh, but instead, the message today is on sexual responsibility. And you're like, well, that's not a very missional focused message. Well, I beg to differ. And uh, so I was, I was, I was praying and, and, and working through Genesis 38, and I had an entire message prepared on the latter half of Genesis 38. And the Lord is like, "Look, you skipped over some stuff here. You can't just skip over these things in the text." And so I went back and I prayed and I looked, and I'm like, "We got to get into this text a little bit." So I sent a public service announcement out to all the parents. Beforehand, this will be a PG rated message. We're not going to use any crude language. We're not going to use any, any, I'm not even going to, I'm going to refrain from making any kind of jokes. Like normally I try to tell, so I don't do very well, but, uh, you know, there's not going to be any joking or anything like that. We're going to use technical terminology. It's nothing your kids wouldn't hear in a, in a health class. It's nothing that, uh, you know, certainly if your kids watch TV, uh, there's things that they haven't. You know, there, there won't be anything that they haven't heard before that their friends have told them. Because uh, here's the bottom line, and, and sometimes I think that we allow Christians to paint us into a corner. They say, well, you talk about sex too much. That's absolutely false. We don't talk about it enough. There's two places that we ought to be talking about sexual responsibility, and that's in the home and in the church. Because the bottom line is that Satan is holding daily sex education classes every single day. And he's co-opted the government. He's co-opted the public school system. He's co-opted the media. He's co-opted your friends and your children's friends. I guarantee it. And your children may already be enrolled. And you don't even know it. And so it is imperative that we talk about these things. So today we are going to talk about sexual responsibility. And I pray that we will see from this message why it is so imperative that we talk about these things from the text of Genesis chapter 38. So if you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 38 this morning. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, we would be pleased to provide you with one. Mr. Neil, bring you one. we got some in the back we love. Put the sword of the spirit that is the word of God into the hands of the people of God. So Genesis chapter 38, we're going to shift gears away from Joseph in our Genesis narrative. We're going to talk about Judah, Joseph's older brother. Genesis chapter 38 is a grievous account, much like Genesis chapter 34. It is an account of a grievous interaction between the people. And what we read is that Judah... Got it for me? Thank you, brother. What we read is that Judah goes down amongst the Canaanites and he finds him a wife from amongst the Canaanites. He takes this Canaanite woman and he conceives a series of sons with her. We read in verses 3 that he conceives a son named Ur, and then he conceives another son named Onan, and then he conceives yet another son named Shelah. And so he has his three sons with this Canaanite woman named Shua. And we're going to start reading in verse 6. Word of God says in verse 6, And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her, 
and raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you, God. I thank you for this word that you have given to us today. God, I pray that even now your Holy Spirit is tilling the rocky soil of our hearts to receive this word. God, I pray that, that right now your spirit is moving in the hearts of your people, convicting us of our sins, calling us to obedience. God, as we worship you through the preaching of your word, God, I pray that we would have our hearts turned completely to you this morning. We ask all these things in the powerful and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Let's get into the text. We're going to focus on verses 8 through 10 will be the, the main verses that we focus on as we talk about sexual responsibility. Now we've got to wade through some cultural things here. Uh, to, to get to the root of the issue here. So we read in verse 8 that Judah, the father, says to Onan, his son, he says, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. Now this is a cultural thing that is put in place, but it is eventually codified in the Mosaic Law. Because you see, in those days, a widow was in a less than privileged position. A widow was in, in society was, was not in a, a good position. They were vulnerable, particularly a childless widow, particularly a widow with no son. In those days, the worth of a woman, unfortunately, was often measured in how many sons that they would have. And so a widow with no children or no sons was in a poor sociological position. And so the cultures and customs of those days dictated that if a, a man died and he left behind a widow, it was the obligation and duty of the next brother to take her as a wife, to conceive a child with her, and then that child would carry on the name of his dead brother. The other factor there is lineage. Again, in our culture today, we don't really care about lineages and names and such. It's not important to us. But in those days, it was very important that a name be carried on. And so what we see here is we see sexuality because let's, let's, let's put the cookies on the bottom shelf. The duty was for the brother to go in and have sexual relationships with his dead brother's wife and conceive a child. And so what we have here is sexuality enslaved to the law of God. It was later codified in the Mosaic Law of Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5. It's called a leveret marriage. It says if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Don't go outside the family to strangers. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that this name, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. You, are you with me? You understand what's going on here, the, the situation that is described in both Genesis 28 and Deuteronomy chapter 25. Again, what we have is sexuality enslaved to the law of God. We have sexuality underneath the authority of Scripture. And this is a good thing. And again, culturally, we don't do this the same way today. We don't have this custom today. But it's good that we see human sexuality underneath the authority of Scripture. Listen, one of the great errors in the church is that we have allowed the world to paint us into a corner whereby all the world hears us say about human sexuality is don't do this, don't do that, never do this, never do that. Listen, God made us as sexual creatures. Your sexuality is woven into your very DNA. It doesn't define us, but it is an implicit part 
of us. And from the very first chapter of Scripture, God describes human sexuality underneath the authority of Scripture. Genesis chapter 2 describes God made everything. And it was very good. He makes the man. But there's no suitable helper for the man. It's not good that the man would be alone, it says. And so God causes him to fall asleep. He takes the rib. He makes the woman. He brings the woman to the man. And what does the man say when he sees the woman? This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He can't believe it. The first time he sets his eyes upon the woman. And it says this is why. The man leaves his mother and father and cleaves to his wife. There's a mingling of souls that happens. Genesis 1.28 is the first command given to the couple. God says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and have dominion over it. This was the original revealed plan of God for his people to spread around the earth. God said, to the man and the woman, be fruitful and multiply. Hebrews 13, 4 tells us, let marriage be held in honor. Let the marriage bed not be defiled. Listen to me, unmarried people, young people, young men, young women. I've got a challenge for you today. I would like you to be a rebel. Be a rebel this morning. Don't do what the world does. Rebel against what the world does. Young men. Find you a young woman, a godly one, young woman. Make her your wife. Have lots of sex with her and lots of children and bring them up in the way of the Lord. This is the way we're given in Scripture. And it is a good thing. Human sexuality underneath the authority of Scripture. We have an entire chapter devoted to sexuality and marriage from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul writes, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Listen, these verses are not a license for subjugation. These verses are not to be used to wield as a club against a wife or a husband who's, who's maybe withholding themselves some. Listen, this is not a license for you men to act like a jerk. <laughs> And then come to your wife and wield these verses and say, yeah, but the Bible says don't deny me. That's not what these verses are for. They are to teach us that sexuality in marriage is about giving. It's not about you. Boy, we want to make it about us, right? It's not about you. It is about a giving. Paul says in Romans 12, 1, offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. What is your sacrifice? Offer yourself, your very body, up to your wife, up to your husband. This is a good gift. This is a good thing. Human sexuality is for procreation. Listen, it's like food. Think about food. Think about the good gift of food. God could have decide, uh, designed us that we would be self-sustaining. God could have designed us so that we did not require nutrition. God could have designed us so that we just eat bland, flavorless food every single day. But no, he gave us the good gift of food. And think of what a wonderful gift food is. We're going to go and break bread together after this service this morning in the fellowship hall. And we're going to, we're going to love on TJ and his family back in the fellowship hall. What, what a good gift that food is. And it's the same way with human sexuality. Listen, God could have designed it so that, so that we would reproduce automatically or, or through a handshake or every nine months. The woman, you know, He could have designed it that way, but he didn't. He gave us this good and righteous gift of sexuality. And it's a good thing. It's for procreation. It's for pleasure. Absence guilt. Absence shame. Absence consequence. Absence fear in the confines of marriage. It is a good thing. He wrote an entire book, the Song of Solomon. And yes, I know that the Song of Solomon can be seen as an image between Christ and the church. That's a valid interpretation of the Song of Solomon. But at its core, it is describing an intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. And I, I love some of the language, and, and I love all of the language, some of the verses. The woman says in Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, she says, on my bed by night... I sought him whom my soul loves. 
She was seeking her husband whom her soul loves. The man says to the woman, he says, you have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes. The woman says, this, this is, she says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Chapter 7, verse 10, she says, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. This is a beautiful picture of the relationship between a husband and wife describing the sexuality as a glue that binds together a man and a woman in marriage. We see sexuality enslaved to the law of God, to the authority of Scripture as a selfless act of giving. And it is a good thing. And praise God for this good gift he has given to us. This is sexual responsibility. Back to the text of Genesis 38. Verse 8, Judah says to Onan, to perform your responsibility to enslave your sexuality to the law of God and generate offspring for your dead brother. Verse 9. But Onan, he knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. Listen, I'm going to assume that everybody here has a basic understanding of human biology and how conception occurs, and you understand what's going on here that we understand. Now, how, how should this have looked? Deuteronomy chapter 25 gives us the way this should have looked if the man did not desire to raise a son for his dead brother. And it's interesting in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 7 through 9, it says that if the husband or the brother does not want to raise a child for his older brother, then they go to the elders at the city gate, because that's where business was conducted in those days, at the city gates. And the woman would say to the elders, look, this man does not want to do his duty. They would confirm that. Do you want to do your duty with your dead brother's wife? And he says, no. And then it says that the woman will remove his sandal and spit in his face. <laughs> How's that for an interesting custom? Now, here in Genesis 38, this is before that was codified in the law. But how should it have looked? He should have just said no. I do not desire to raise a son for my dead brother. I'm not going to take this woman, Tamar, as my wife. But what does he do? He goes into her. He wants to have sexual relationships with her. Absence, the responsibility. He wants to ingratiate or gratify himself. But he does not want the requirement that comes with that. So he wastes his semen on the ground. This is sexuality out from underneath the authority of God. And this, I'm going to tell you what this text is not. This text, chapter 9 in particular, has been misused in a couple of different ways. It has been misused by pastors to preach against masturbation. Boy, I bet you never thought you'd come to church and hear your pastor say the word masturbation, right? And if you're a visitor, I don't say that word every single Sunday. I promise. But there are plenty of verses that can speak against masturbation, like those against lust. I don't know how you can possibly masturbate without lusting. But that is not what this text is talking about. There are those who use this text to, to say it's, a, it's against birth control. That's not what this text is. So I can find no text against birth control other than the mandate for Christians to have children and bring them up in the way of the Lord. This text is talking about sexual irresponsibility. Gratification with no responsibility. Pleasure with no restraint. A self-centered focus upon our own carnal desires. Never mind what it costs anybody else. Think about what it cost Tamar. He continued to go into her. Never mind what it cost this woman. What did it cost this woman? It cost her a lot. She was already a widow. 
And again, in those days when you suffered in some way, it was seen that you must have sin in your life. So she's suffering as a widow. She must have sinned in some way. And now she can't even conceive a son. It's not like Onan is going around telling everybody, well, I'm wasting my seed on the ground. That's why we're not having a son. No, he continued to go into her. And I can hear him saying, well, I don't know what's wrong with her. I I'm trying. I'm doing my part. But she's not conceiving. There must be something wrong with her. He wanted to gratify his own sexuality, his own sexual desires, no matter what it cost anybody else. Keeping up shame upon this woman. This is unbridled, unrestrained sexuality. He's made an idol out of gratification. He's made an idol out of ejaculation. He's made an idol out of sexual satisfaction. Book of Judges says in Judges 21, 25, describing the descent of Israel into sin. It says in those days, there was no king. Everyone did what they wanted. There was no king. There was no authority. So everybody did just what they wanted. And we saw the end state of that. Scripture talks about sin in a couple of different ways. Psalm chapter 19 refers to sins of hidden sins and sins of presumption. A hidden sin are things that you don't even know are sins. It's still sin whether you know it or not. That's why we pray God reveal to us our hidden sins. Sins of presumption are sins that we know what God says. We know what the word of God says. We know what he would have us do or have us not do. We look at God, we say, thank you very much, God. I will do what I want. Presuming the forgiveness of God, slandering his grace. Psalm 32 describes, uses three different words to describe sin. Translated iniquity, sin, and transgression. The word translated iniquity, Hebrew word is avon, which means a perversion. Which means that we have taken something from God and we twisted it and changed it into something it was never intended to be. Think about the good gift of food. You know what the number one killer of Americans is? And I say, it's not COVID. It's heart disease, by far. Heart disease kills hundreds of thousands of Americans every single year and the two primary causes of heart disease are gluttony and sloth. Overweight people eating, eating, eating too much food and not doing enough activity. We've taken the good gift of food and again, don't, guilty of gluttony. It's the same with human sexuality. As we twisted it and perverted it into something it was never meant to be, forsaking the ways of God. How has that worked out for us? I'd like to give you some data, if I may. The largest pornographic website in the world, I'm not going to tell you the name of it because you already know it. Chances are you've been to it. Has 100 million daily visits. 30.3 billion searches, billion every single day, every single second. Just on this one website, there are 962 searches for pornographic material. There are 12 new videos with two hours of content up uploaded every single minute. 29% of the visitors of this website are female, in case you think it's a male problem. The, the United States ranks number one in the world in the production of and the export of pornography. 50% of the pornographic websites in the world originate in the United States. They have more visits than Netflix, Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. 30% of the internet is porn. One third of the internet is pornographic. It generates more revenue than all major league sports combined. The NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, over $3,000 a second. It is shaping the way Americans think. Almost 
Over 40% of Americans think pornography is acceptable. It's a 7% increase from last year. This one grieves me. 11 is the average age of exposure, <coughs> meaning that there are younger than 11, 7, 8, 9 that are exposed to pornography. From one study that I read, many young girls consume pornography because they want to learn how to meet boys' expectations. That ought to just grieve our hearts and make us fall to our faces in repentance right now. The violent content continues to increase. Physical aggression, verbal aggression, almost all of it against women. Every single year, the American economy loses tens of billions of dollars of lost productivity from employees consuming pornography at work. Lasting ramifications rewires our brains. There's an entire generation of young men being raised who are incapable of intimacy with a woman and becoming less and less likely to ever marry. Almost all sexual offenses committed, and I'm talking rape, battery, sexual assault, affairs, have as their foundation pornography. It is the foundation for all of this. Canadian researchers a couple of years ago were trying to do a study. They needed a control group of men who had never viewed pornography. They abandoned the study because they could not find a single man who had never viewed pornography. This is sexuality out from underneath the authority of God. This is a twisting of a good gift that God has given to us for our own personal pleasure and never mind what it costs somebody else. Do you think these young girls desire to be in these videos? The United States is number one in another category. We are the number one destination for sexually trafficked young girls. The United States is the number one destination, leading the world in that. And every single time you click on that mouse, you are maybe previously unwittingly, but from here forth you will be wittingly contributing to the subjugation of young girls. CDC reports that every single year we set a record for sexually transmitted diseases in the United States. Every single year. 20% of Americans presently have a sexually transmitted disease. 68 million Americans have a sexually transmitted disease. It costs our nation 16 billion in health care every single year. There are 26 million new cases each year. There are 2.5 million new cases each year of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Something else that will break your heart. The highest population for new syphilis infections, newborn babies. Newborn babies as we give these diseases to our children. 1.2 million active HIV cases in America. One million people a year globally die still from AIDS. Many of them in sub-Saharan Africa. This is sexuality out from underneath the authority of God. This is sexuality out from underneath the authority of Scripture. Every single year, Nearly a million babies are aborted in the womb, killed. 62 million since 1973, Roe versus Wade was passed. 3,000 babies a day, 125 an hour, two per minute. By the time I finish this sermon, 80 children will have been killed in the womb. And if you look, 24% of women by age 45 will have had an abortion. 18% of pregnancies. 18% are terminated in abortion. 30% of those who have an abortion are self-identifying as Christians. Statistically and episodically, most ladies that have abortion have previous kids. It disproportionately targets minorities and poor people. In New York City, anecdotally, more African-American children are aborted every year than born. This is a plague as a function of human sexuality out from underneath the authority of Scripture. This is 
sexual irresponsibility. We see the destruction of the nuclear family in America. 25% of American families are headed up by a single parent, almost always a single mother. And God bless the single mothers. I married a single mother who are out there struggling. But the fact is, is that kids raised by single mothers disproportionately suffer underneath of all the afflictions of society, poverty, incarceration, addiction, mental health issues, name an affliction. And almost always, it's because of the sexual irresponsibility of the father who just like Onan sought his own pleasure, his own gratification without the responsibility. We see sexual responsibility lead to brokenness, broken homes, broken hearts, broken dreams, broken lives, broken marriage. And God considers it seriously. Let's get back to the text of verse 10. How serious does God take this issue? Verse 10 says what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord. Again, it's a sexual irresponsibility. And what did God do? Put him to death. He didn't rebuke him. He didn't correct him. He didn't chastise him. God killed him because of his sexual irresponsibility. There's a very popular very popular female Bible or women's Bible teacher. And again, I'm not going to tell you her name because I don't want you to go listen to her. But she said this and, and it was plagiarized by a very popular pastor, the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention. They said this. The Bible seems to whisper about some sins and shout about other sins. And we ought to whisper about the sins the Bible whispers about, and we ought to shout about the sins the Bible shouts about. And the Bible seems to whisper about sexual sin. And it seems to shout about sins like greed and pride. And so we ought to shout about those sins. This is some of the worst theology I've ever heard in my life. If I'd have been sitting in the church that day, I'd have gotten up and walked out right then. The Bible whispers about sexual sin. It's got an entire section of a chapter devoted to sexual sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Do you know that every single sexual partner you have before your husband and your wife, you will take them with you into your marriage. They will be in your marriage bed forevermore. It's what Paul is telling us here. He says, he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spear with him. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when you sin sexually, you are sinning against the temple of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 13, 4, God will judge the sexually immoral and the idolaters. The Bible whispers about sexual sin. Really? Is that what we're going to say? First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine. Paul says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. None of them will inherit the kingdom of God. Paul writes to the Thessalonians in first Thessalonians chapter four, verses three through six. He says, this is the will of God for your sanctification. What is the will of God? That we abstain from sexual immorality. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. And why? Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. The Bible whispers about sexual sin. Is that really what we're going to say? Here's the bottom line about sexual sin. The bottom line is sexual sin is revelatory. It reveals something. And what does it re reveal? 
but godlessness. And listen, I'm not one standing here to judge you. This is the word of God. I'll tell you outright that I wrestled and struggled with sexual sin for the first decade of my Christian walk. And if you want to come and talk to me about it, I will gladly talk to you about this. But this is what the word of God says. That it reveals something about our hearts. At the very least, there's something wrong in our walk if we're living in blatant, unconfessed sexual sin. And then we look at the rampant sexual sin in our nation today. And I've heard people say that God is going to judge our country for our rampant sexual sin today. I've got news for you. God has already judged our nation. For Romans chapter 1, our sin is that we have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And we've worshipped and served the created thing rather than the creator. Therefore, God has turned us over to our passions. God has said, you want to participate in sexual sin? Well, have at it. How has that worked out for us? It's revelatory. What then should we do? I know that each and every single person in here, adult, maybe some youngsters as well, have fallen into sexual sin. I know this. You know this. 1 Corinthians 6.18 Flee from sexual immorality. If I can impress one thing upon you today, it's the serious nature of it. We've got to flee. Paul doesn't say stand and fight. Paul doesn't say resist. Paul doesn't say, look, put up your best effort. No, he says run. Jesus says gouge out your eye. Cut off your right hand. Take drastic steps. Do whatever you can because it will rot your soul. It grieves my heart that we've made sexual purity almost like a superpower today. That we just can't believe that anybody would be sexually pure. We've almost made it some sort of mythical status. I'd like to give you a revelation today. Men, women too. It is possible not to look at pornography. Did you know that? I'm praying that this word is falling heavy upon our hearts today. I'm praying that we would do what God tells us to do. And repent. Repent of our sins and turn from our wickedness. Listen, the blood of, the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ, there's no sin that it cannot cover. But we've got to see this sin the same way that God does. And my prayer is that we would mourn this sin. It would grieve us. We would see how we are like Onan and have been and desire our own gratification. Never mind what it costs anybody else. I pray that even now the word of God is examining your hearts. That you would repent and turn from these sins. Who do you need to teach? I see there's young people in here. We've got to teach these things to our young people. I was never once taught a biblical sexual ethic. Not once. I would give anything if I could go back and somebody could say, listen to me, young man. Let me tell you what the Word of God says. But we have that chance. We have that opportunity. Today, right now, after this service, Thank you. commit. Last I'll say, maybe your sexual sin is revelatory of godlessness. I don't want to presume forgiveness on anyone in here. Maybe the problem is you've never been saved. Maybe you've never repented of your sin and believed upon the Lord Jesus. Glory and hallelujah that this would be the day. Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you and we praise you. God, I thank you for this word. God, we love the word of God that penetrates right to our hearts and dividing us 